Well, it's lovely to see all of you here today. Uh, it's Brain Awareness Week. We're coming to the end of it, and it's fantastic to see uh, people being interested in the art and neuroscience side of things. So what I'm going to do for the next five minutes is just tell you a little bit about what Parkinson's is, because I know some of you probably don't know a lot about it and don't have a, a lot of ideas of the studies that are happening, and just give a few slides of one of the many studies that are happening, our study here um, in the John Radcliffe Hospital, and, and tell you a little bit about the hope that there is out there in terms of uh, what uh, ourselves and colleagues, both here and around the world, are trying very hard to um, study and solve, hopefully, in the next few years. So I work at the John Radcliffe Hospital in the Clinical Neurosciences Department uh, with Jacqueline, and um, I, I run a group called the Neurometrology Lab. So Parkinson's disease, for those of you that are not familiar uh, with it, is a neurological disorder. It's a progressive neurodegenerative condition. Um, and the question that most people usually ask me when I give this, this sort of um, talks is, who gets Parkinson's and why do I have Parkinson's and someone else next to me doesn't? And a few years ago, when we started talking about Parkinson's, if you look at all the national websites, for instance, Parkinson's UK, you would see that they would say every hour, someone in the UK gets Parkinson's. Unfortunately, nowadays, because we have an aging population, we know that every hour, two people in the UK get Parkinson's disease. And this sort of shows to you how much impact uh, the aging population and sort of the, um, the increase of, of number of, of people with Parkinson's is having in, in what we see, not only in the UK, but worldwide. So it affects about 1% of people over the age of 55. And I think the latest statistics, um, when I looked it up the other day, is that worldwide we have between 12 and 14 million people currently living with the disorder. And in the next 10 to 15 years, this is set to exponentially increase, uh, which is why a lot of us are very keen to do something to at least slow down the disease progression and the hope would be to halt it even at the very early stages. So very briefly, there are two sides of Parkinson's, the motor symptoms, which most people are usually aware if they do hear the term Parkinson's, so slowing of movement, tremor, rigidity, uh, stiffness, and what you usually refer to as a Parkinsonian mask, where you ask someone who has Parkinson's to smile or have an expression, and Paul is making faces to me here, but you don't really um, get that expression, although the people feel like they are performing the smile, the anger, the sadness, and so on. That doesn't really transfer to someone who is looking at them or testing them in a study or in clinic. But what we haven't really told people a lot uh, 10 years ago is about the other side of Parkinson's. The fact that there is a whole range of non-motor symptoms, which is what I've been particularly passionate in studying um, in our study that I'll show you in a couple of minutes. So loss of sense of smell. People are not able to smell years and years prior to getting the diagnosis of, of uh, this condition. They have problems with their sleep, and a list of other problems, including depression, feeling very anxious, but also a range of cognitive problems, including things like decision-making, memory problems, and so on. And the list goes on and on. But what I should mention is that if anybody has these problems, it's not specific to Parkinson's. And this is why it makes our life much harder in terms of understanding whether someone is going to develop Parkinson's in the next few years. Existing treatments, there's a range of different drugs that are out there. Uh, the most sort of known one is levodopa or Cinemet, for those of you who are taking it in the audience. And they do treat symptoms when they work well. They work well for a few years. They might well well for some people or better for some people and worse for others. But again, this is, this is not curing the disorder. Okay? So this is, this is treating your disease and it's hopefully giving you a better quality of life for some time. But that's not the answer that everybody's trying to look for at the moment. And none of them slow down disease progression or halt it at the very early stages. On the other side of the story, there's also a surgical procedure. Again, it's not a cure. It treats um, symptoms and it gives people better quality of life again. This is called deep brain stimulation. 
It's an electrical simulation of specific deep brain areas, um, usually done bilaterally, where the neurosurgeons implant electrodes into the patient's brain, and they provide electrical stimulation um, continually that do, does similar, a similar job to what the, um, the medication does uh, as well. Again, it can give you a better quality of life, it can remove some of the symptoms that we see, but it will not slow down the, the disease progression. So, very briefly, let me tell you one of the studies that's taking place in the area of Parkinson's. This is a study I run at the John Radcliffe Hospital. It's called OXQIP. This is short for Oxford Quantification in Parkinsonism. And I set to do this because I, um, I was working with a number of people uh, from the Oxford Parkinson's branch who were very interested in monitoring their symptoms very, very precisely with a new technology that has come out. So not only depend on the clinical neurological assessment, but having numbers, measuring it in a way that you remove the human factor if that's possible. So it's a longitudinal study um, and uh, we have visits every three months. This is a four year study. So we've just finished the second year, we're halfway through, through this trial. And it's to precisely measure any subtle abnormalities in the timing, speed and coordination of a range of movements. Okay? And I'm very, very grateful uh, to UCB, it's a pharmaceutical company that has given us a very generous amount of money to be running this study uh, for the, the duration of, of, uh, of OxQuip. The reason for this is obviously drug evaluation, and that's where most of these studies uh, stem for. Because I didn't know this till I started working more closely with pharma companies that a very, very small number of drugs actually make it to the market. And how much, how many millions, if not billions of pounds are spent when you're developing and trialing um, vast amount of resources are, are being consumed. And Jim and Kevin and Sally and Paul have all been talking about the amount of, of um, sort of funds that are spent in developing these sort of drug trials. And I think the one million dollar question here is my third point, whether we can kill off research into drugs that are not going to work for one reason or another, and whether we can quickly divert both time and money to something else, the next target, that maybe we have learned something from the studies we've done up to now, and therefore we can use our knowledge. I never feel that any study that hasn't worked doesn't give us anything, because all the negatives is what move on the development of drugs are in the future. And that's what we're hoping to fill in a little bit of the big puzzle uh, with our study um, here in Oxford. So. Um, just a couple of pictures, and uh, I'm using Jim's picture here that he very kindly allowed us to be filmed when we started uh, this, uh, this study. We look at eye movements, we ask you to look at different dots on the, on the wall, and we ask you to follow certain things and measure how quickly your eyes are moving. We also use a lot of technology to be able to measure how your gait is, how your posture is, how you're moving along the room. And what you can see here, uh, Jim wearing, if this. So uh, this is called a kinesia accelerometer. It's put on the, on the finger and then on the shoes when people are uh, doing the different types of uh, assessments that we have. And Jim can tell you a little bit more later on when we're having our discussion. And it's been proving extremely interesting and the results we're just about to publish that are showing how you can digitize UPVRS. A lot of our colleagues in the States have done this. We're not the ones that were sort of confirming this, but the results are interesting is that they're encouraging. And we are also seeing similar results from other studies as well. We're also using different um, types of um, things like Fitbit and Apple Watch. So we have sensors on the upper limbs, on the feet, we have one on the chest and one on the lumbar. And this gives us a better idea of how your gait is, which we cannot do unless we have very expensive pieces of equipment, uh, a gait lab, which again is very difficult to have in places like Oxford because of lack of space and so on. And again, this is providing fantastic information uh, for what we're trying to quantify really and measure in the future. This just shows you the ability of some of the technology we're using in terms of how many sensors you can use and the amount of data that you see behind it that you can get. And I'm just going to finish by showing you what some of the data looks like. Don't worry about the little details in the graphs here, but this is just a, a small sort of snitch 
just just to um, get a better idea of how much technology can help us look into the individual personalized medicine, which I very much hope we can take forward in the next couple of years. So. I've divided the different um, sort of uh, panels here, one on the upper left, the, the early stages, people who don't take any medication, on the right hand side people who are sort of mid-early stages of their disorder, and then on the lower side here people who are more severe and their spouse's healthy control. And the reason why I'm showing this is to show you that even when you have someone who is considered a healthy control who doesn't have a neurological disorder or hasn't been diagnosed with a neurological disorder can still exhibit movements of this sort. What you see there is when you ask the participants to stand still like this with their feet separated for 30 seconds and close their eyes. Try it when you want to finish this and you will find that even if you don't have a neurological disorder you will still be swaying a little bit because we all have what we call a physiological sway. That physiological sway usually stays within this ellipse. This is what the algorithm that the people were working with that were developing this um, sort of display. So anybody could have any sort of sway in between this, but anything over and above, so you see this shaky bit, is when the Parkinson's kicks in. But again, this sort of data is not easy to interpret because there's such a huge range of, of uh, Parkinson's types, Parkinson's uh, sort of moods if you like, if you've taken your medication and so on. And it makes it really difficult if you just try to see someone and give them a number or just uh, stage them if you like uh, from a clinical point of view if something is very subtle and you cannot see it. So I'm just trying to make the point that technology is extremely important in these situations and I'm hoping that um, in the future we'll be able to share with you next year some of the um, fantastic sort of results and the commitment of the 150 people who've been coming to the JR for the last uh, two and a half years, every three months, to, to do these sort of um, experiments. So this is some of my group that are carrying most of the hard work, and I'm very, very grateful and honoured to have them and work with them. And uh, I think we'll, um, we'll move to you, yeah? And then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, so that was the neuroscience. Now we're going to have the art. Uh, so I'm really excited to introduce Yejong Muta, who is an artist who has studied at the Royal College of Arts. And she's now based in Berlin. Um, and we've been collaborating with her on our Picturing Parkinson's project. And she's had the opportunity to come and sit in on some of Kristalina's Oxquip clinics at the hospital and to meet some people living with Parkinson's. So now she's going to spend a bit of time talking to you about her work. Hi, I'm Yejong Muta. Thank you for the invitation for this uh, wonderful project, Parkin Parkinson's. Yeah, during Parkinson, I am a research-based artist and an artist ba art-based researcher, and I work about the neuroscience. And then I'm interested in the how the artistic uh, our creation comes from the from the brain. And then, as you saw before, I and then there are several works around you, and I'm using this tool, which is 3D printing pen. It's uh, well known for the kids' toy, but uh, as as a professional artist, I also use this one. And well, uh, because the technology is growing up, and then I thought that there are more possibilities, and then I gra grasped this. This was my first. Um, project, I used this uh, 3D printing pen. I, I, I was quite surprised when I was making it. I somehow could manage the volume and then scale. This was a life size of the person. And then, yeah, while I was building it, I could also feel that um, like um, the very, uh, very normal, this spatial sense is making me to grow up grow up this architectural structure you can see here. Well, um, as you can see, my topic, my concept is all, of, all about the human and the human body, hum, human relationship, or yeah, hum, humanity. Um, 
this was uh, how I developed my portrait things. I used to take the street photography because I was interested in people around me. And then uh, this street photography came into my portrait type of uh, artworks. And then I collected them and then I exhibited in the show RCA which, was happen which happened the last year, 2018. And then, as you can see here, and then also upstairs, you can also see this, which is showing the, <coughs> yeah, the shadow only part. And you can play with the light and then see different um, perception, <coughs> perspective of the human face. And then I will um, quickly show the video clip. So this is how I worked in the studio. As you can see, it's not flat surface. I just draw in the air and then make a form. I am right-handed, so I use my right hand and then sometimes it's, yeah, on the table for this text, you know, text type. But yeah, with my left hand, I kind of shape it, form it. Sometimes it has different layers. As you just saw before, there, uh, um, there is a white layer, black layer, and then with the different um, background color, you can see the whiteness and then the blackness in different way. I tried several different types, and then this one is a kind of big portrait, and then I needed uh, some strength to make it stable, so I kind of, uh, had a, like a stitched type of this. Um, yeah, portrayed. And then developing, while I was developing this, own, my own technique, I, this is Tate Modern, and then I, um, okay, yeah, this is the, my performance at the Tate Modern, at the Turban Hall. It was part of the off print, the printing uh, festival. And then I could have a small table there and then I show how to make it in front of yeah, all the audience there. I took the picture at that place and then uh, made the portrait at the place. This is the show RCA where I exhibited my works. And then maybe you might already, yeah, done it. But yeah, with the torchlight, you could see the different um, shadows. While you are rolling around, you could see the animated shadow as well. So it was about the perception, how we perceive the world, and then now what we are missing. So, uh, as you can see, I am very keen to interactive art, and then I wanted to give uh, immersive experience to the audience. And then to make it more like immersive, I wanted to invite everyone into my art. So I used this a VR device as well. I had my own skill with the hand, so I used this. Um, VR, I went inside, I draw the sculpture inside the virtual reality. And then now people are seeing that, uh, that giant guy who is uh, holding them on, their, on, on his palm with the beautiful nature around. You cannot see it from here, it's all like white wall only. But inside that glasses, you could see the different perspective, different perception. No, other thing is, they are seeing the virtual reality, but they could even touch that fingers. <laughs> so yeah, you could touch it, and yeah, it was a. Uh, 
another part of my project, which was the combining more like a, more with technology. And then what I brought in these pieces were, I, I thought it is about the cognitive error that w our brain <coughs> is doing to us. Um, we think that normally what we see is, it, it comes to what you believe, but perception sometimes doesn't really equal to the truth, I thought. Our senses come to our brain and then our brain tells our consciousness what we are seeing. And then from there, from those uh, signals, we have some gaps and then I, I thought, I, yeah, it is very important to understand what brains tell us. And so, yeah, that, uh, that was uh, how I met uh, Kristalina. And then uh, we talked about this perception, the neuroscience. And then oh, I uh, very uh, luckily, I could uh, be engaged in this uh, Parkinson, picture in Parkinson project. And then this was very first image I had about the Parkinson. I hope <laughs> you could see what I was thinking. And I firstly thought I didn't know much, many things about the Parkinson before I did the research. And then I thought it's about the getting old. It's about, uh, I, I was just imagining, yeah, how my grandpa looked like, how, how he walked and how was my grandma. And then I kind of made a bit of abstract image out of it. And then I was putting more theme about the, the struggle of the neuroscientists and the complexity of the Parkinson disease, so what our brain is doing, you know, the, the like a dysfunction of the basal ganglia our brain is having because of this Parkinson. And then I, I and maybe the neuroscientists that also don't know the exact causality of the Parkinson, and then we don't know yet how to cure it. But uh, we are still str struggling, and then we are getting there, I thought. And then, so I thought maybe for this project, not just drawing the brain, uh, what I, I, I was questioning what I can do about the Parkinson, and then, so I uh, studied about the Parkinson, and then I met uh, Kristalina, Jacqueline, and then other uh, patients as well. I saw some papers, and then I kind of visualized, uh, yeah, in my own way. Yeah, this is how I work, and then I'm Nia Jangmuta. If you have any inquiry, you can also email me there. Thank you. Yijong. That was really interesting. Now it's time for our panel discussion. So I'm going to invite Kristalina and Yijong and two of people living with Parkinson's, Jim and Sally, to come and sit at the front. So now is uh, your chance to think about any questions you might want to ask these people. So while you're having a think about um, what you might like to know, I'm going to kick off with, uh, with one question. So we haven't heard from our, our lovely people here yet, so I'm going to start with Jim, this is Jim Sheridan. Um, Jim, can you tell us how you got involved with Kristalina's study, which she talked about earlier, called the Oxquip study? Yes, I really, since I was diagnosed in 2010, I've had an interest in research anyway. Uh, it's, it's very therapeutic to be involved in, in Parkinson's research. Uh, you come into contact with really enthusiastic researchers and they just kind of give you hope and uh, Kristalina is also as, as a doctor the Oxford branch um, <laughs> she, she, she regularly attends our meetings and she participates in a lot of our activities so I knew Kristalina anyway and the other thing as far as this Oxquip trial is concerned uh, I think Kristalina knew that it would spike a would, would, would uh, strike a, a chord with me um, because I was very enth in enthusiastic about measuring Parkinson's myself and this, this arose because we, we've heard about how medication works for some and doesn't work so well for others it doesn't work very well for me and I felt I had to quantify that um, for, for the benefit of my, my consultant and um, 
So I measured a, a range of parameters that I could just measure at home. And not using the t technology that, that um, Crystalina is developing, which is so much more superior. Um, but so the, the interest in measuring just attracted me to that, that research project. That's great. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Sally, can I just bring you in um, quickly here? So you're in charge of the Oxford branch of Parkinson's UK. So can you tell us a bit more about your involvement so far with Crystalina and these art and neuroscience projects? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I met you, Crystalina, some time ago. And we were talking at the time <clears throat> about my concern about uh, patient loss of voice. <clears throat> about 80% of people with Parkinson's they have reduced voice function or whatever it's at some stage or another. And some of the members of the group actually had no voice, no voice, and found it very hard to um, shape their mouths to, uh, to, 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 so you could lip read, for example. Um, as you saw on, on the, the descriptions from, from Crystalina, um, you get the mask, so, you know, I am mask. <laughs> I try to smile, but it doesn't always come out as, as, as sunny, sunnily as it ought to. Um, and the, with the, this loss of movement in the face, and using, using the, um, the, the, the voice, your, ex, your physical expressions are reduced because Parkinson's reduces everything about your body. So that's how I got involved with Kristalina. But her involvement then came to the branch, and she noticed the, um, the, the, the voice reduction in a lot of people and was quite intuitive about that, which I was very, very impressed with. Um, since then, we've kept personal contact, which has been wonderful. Um, but really, my, uh, my role now is as chair of the branch to try to encourage people with Parkinson's to actually improve their quality of life. It doesn't matter how you do it. If, you, if, you, if it means doing jazz dancing, go and do jazz dancing. If it's, if it's doing art, do art. But it's actually about, you know, my feel, I feel my role is to encourage people to go out and actually do something. So, for example, last year, from our branch alone, we had somebody abseiled down Guildford Cathedral Tower. Somebody walked the length of, 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 of Hadrian's Wall. Somebody else, a couple cycled to Durham, all 350 miles of it. I did a skydive a few, days, a few years ago. And Paul, sitting here, who's doing, he's right in the front, Hello. who, who uh, is, is a comedy writer, has taken a, a different stage now and is now a stand up comic. And he is really quite funny. <laughs> oh, I should point that out. He is actually quite funny. <laughs> Many of the stories he's got from <laughs> our liaison and the things that have gone wrong in our lives uh, that we found very, very funny. But, you know, it, whatever, whatever, you know, it, it takes to encourage people to actually live their life to the full <clears throat> is important because the medication is very limited and there is great need for this condition to be addressed quite seriously now. Because if this were a, a condition such as HIV, it would be a pandemic. We have reached that sort of stage with, with the condition. So those of us with the, with the condition, although we strive to, to live lives to the full and not shake about all over the place, but to actually, we, we do our utmost to get the word out there to let people know how important it is for serious research to go into it, which is where Oxcript comes in because it's, it's monitoring patients very carefully. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Sally, for sharing that with us. Um, does anybody in the audience have any burning questions that they want to ask any of our panel, either about the neuroscience or the art or <coughs> people's experience of living with Parkinson's? Well, can I just say, um, it was very interesting, the, the slide at the beginning about the, the, um, the words that people came up with, that tremor yes. was very large indeed. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I think that reflects our understanding of Parkinson's, which is that people associate Parkinson's, sorry, I was trying to 
Um, people associate Parkinson's with tremor, but actually the third of us don't have a tremor. And the speech is something that I've noticed as being particularly important. Something else that's very important is swallowing. Because if we don't control our swallowing mechanism, we will start taking things in the wrong way, and that can cause aspiration and can cause all sorts of, you know, Absolutely. problems. And so there are all sorts of aspects of Parkinson's that people are not as aware of as they should be, and it's partly because the press mm -hmm. keep going on about, about shaking and, and tremor, and that's only one aspect. And, and the other thing I would just like to say is I agree that, that trying new things is so important because it leads to plasticity of the brain, as I understand it, and, and we can light up new bits of our brain um, by trying new things if we possibly can. So, and I'm doing uh, comedy, and uh, I did the Edinburgh Fringe last year, and I don't know whether there's investigation into to the effects of art, you know, the art and the effect of doing art on people, but when I did my show, I felt better. Right. And it makes me, it, it improves my condition when I perform. So, and I'm about to go on a national tour. So. <laughs> that was so. <laughs> Which is very exciting. But I think, Paul, you're bringing in a very interesting question. Why did the word tremor predominate you know, the first poll? And I wonder what's going to happen in the next few minutes when we ask everybody again to tell us a couple of words of what comes to mind when uh, you hear the terms Parkinson's, because I, I expected that maybe tremor with a non-motor symptom would be the two big questions really we've been mm. discussing it and we didn't want to think about it, but what, how do you, what do you think else we can do to you know, get people to forget about the traditional way we look at Parkinson's and that, you know, as you say yourself, you don't have tremor uh, and other people don't have tremor and, and what do you do about it? That, the, the perception is there that the motoric part, yes, Ali. Yeah. It's called education, right. I think, mm. and uh, it's it's about because the only uh, diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis based on those uh, the movements mm -hmm. beginning, and it's about educating the students, the, the medical students, and this here I will introduce Gabe, who's sitting there. Who's, <laughs> Just woken up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. No. Gabriel, because he has introduced uh, the expert patient tutor, and I am an expert patient tutor. Uh, my last visit to, to the hospital to, to, to support the year five medical students was yesterday. And it is such a satisfi satisfactory thing to do because I'm offering the students a far fuller understanding and view of, of living with Parkinson's. It's not just about the movements and the twitching and the whatever it is. It's about the, the everyday living. Okay, peeling a potato it may not seem very important to you, but it's so irritating. You can peel the potato, but turning the potato in the one, the other hand is so difficult. We have Non-motor symptoms such as bladder difficulties, where you have urgency, constipation is a thing, as Paul quite clearly lays out. If you have constipation and a loss of sense of smell, it goes together quite well. But the <laughs> and I have to say, Paul and I do find things very, very funny with yes. our condition. <laughs> but, but on a on a more serious level, educating these medical students to have a fuller understanding of how it is to and giving them an opportunity to um, address a, a patient with a better understanding of, of what it's, it's all about is so important. And for me, as for Paul, doing something for somebody else makes you feel better. I feel really good about doing this. I get tired doing it because tiredness is a feature of Parkinson's. Anxiety is a feature of Parkinson's. Depression is a feature of Parkinson's. But there's so much more, and there is so much hope. And I can tell you now, when I did that skydive, I was flying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a responsibility on those of us with Parkinson's to get out there mm -hmm. and say what the experience is, because only then can we 
you know, explain to people. And I think we are starting to, to change the image, because I, when I first got Parkinson's, which was eight years ago, I got the sense that as far as the charity was concerned, Parkinson's, you get marvellous charity, but if you want to raise money, you raise money by showing people how pathetically useless people with Parkinson's are, and how sad and how desperate they are for, for, for support. And actually, we're not. I mean, we yet. are towards the end. Yet. But yet. But there's a lot of other things, and we need to sort of tell people, and be honest about it. You know, um, uh, all the different symptoms, stiffness in the arms and legs that we get, and, and erectile dysfunction, you know, which I think is a particularly cruel one, because given that I get stiffness in the arms and legs, it's very <laughs> Possible to keep a straight you face. You see us in ballet. Yes. <laughs> but this is this is what inspires us as well as a neuroscientist and someone who is hoping that I'll be able to offer even a very very small piece to the big puzzle that we're dealing with. Is people like ourselves and other people in the audience that have Parkinson's. I think Gabe, you would agree that they inspire us mm. to to move on in the difficult era that we have ahead of us. I'm not going to talk about Brexit, we're going to edit that, okay? But, uh, you know, the funding is becoming harder to, to put um, uh, things, uh, events like today with Jacqueline is becoming harder because although we've got full support from, you know, people like uh, uh, the university, the vice chancellor, the Wellcome Trust, these things are becoming smaller and smaller. So it's people like yourselves that really inspire me at least, and I know that other, other colleagues of mine feel strongly about it, to keep us going and to give us your time and give you the opportunity to come and see what it is to look at Parkinson's from the way we think we can cure it or give something to it. There was some, someone else here. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah? yeah. So I, I, was, I was really interested by what you were saying about measurements. Yes. And uh, I don't know how many people here saw the fantastic BBC documentary that was aired in two parts over the last couple of weeks about the mm -hmm. recent trial of GDNF in Parkinson's. Yes. Uh, I thought that was just a spectacular piece of documentary making. Mm -hmm. BBC is its best, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to have lit a fire under a discussion that's been going on anyway mm -hmm. about whether the clinical rating scale, the UPDRS, for measuring Parkinson's progress is really fit for purpose or not. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what the interaction is between the very highly, um, uh, highly numerical measurement that you're doing compared with the clinical assessment of the, uh, are, are there any interactions really being investigated right now? Is there any progress on making Parkinson's rating more accurate, more reliable, and a better contributor to good research? Yeah. You know, you ask a, a fantastic question because this is why we're doing what we're doing. And what I showed on one of the slides is one of the accelerometers that Jim knows very well from uh, being someone who's come for the last three years uh, uh, doing this sort of, of, of um, testing. The accelerometer, which is called a kinesia, it's basically giving you greater sensitivity on top of the clinical rating skill that is used in, in the clinical setup, if you like. And you, I can't answer your question 100% because the first results just have just come in. And we can see that we have a good correlation with the UPDRS on certain areas. But as you know, and if, if everybody, uh, if people are not aware, the UPDRS is a, is, a, is a questionnaire, it's a scale that we use when you try to uh, see how bad or how good or what's the progression <coughs> someone's um, sort of uh, disorder is. So Jonathan, I think you're bringing up a, a question that we will be asking for the next few years. Which technology will provide us with that information? I can tell you the kits of technology we're using are certainly 
useful, but that's not the end of it. And that's why um, James and Kevin McFarlane, who's been very much involved with our study, looking into um, how you self-assess, um, you, yeah. you know, do self-assessments, and Jim, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. But how do you measure something that, of someone who's at home, who's not able to come to our study, or is unable to attend any of the trials because it's not close to them, and so on and so forth. So Jim, maybe you want to say something about your yeah. experience, because you've been using different types yes. of technology. Well, I, I, what I've used is, is just simple stuff, um, a stopwatch. Uh, you know, to, to measure the, the amount of time that it takes me to walk uh, a mile or something, or, 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 or a few yards, you know, depending on how, what, how, how good I am on a particular day. Um, uh, I, I use a, an earthquake uh, app on my phone to measure my tremor. The thing, the thing is. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I time myself writing a, a, a set piece of, of text. Um, and there's another one I can't remember. There's, there's, essentially, anything that, that we have a limitation in, and it, it's different for each of us, you can measure it. And, and you, what, what, I, what I did was I measured, I, I took a, did a baseline, uh, and then when I started changing my medication, I carried on measuring it every day, a number of parameters. And it showed how the medication was or was not helping me, and in, in, in what ways. And, and I, I had a, a particularly awkward situation where it seemed to help my upper body, but it, it, it slowed down my, my lower body. So, so I, I, I get dystonia in the legs. And, and, and my, my left leg twists, and that's, that's when I just start taking the medication. Uh, so about an hour after I take my meds, I'll get, start getting stiffer, and then that'll last for another couple of hours, and then, and then it'll ease off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the, one of the measurements that I did was to walk around the block um, every hour on the hour, for a, for a day and, and see where the, the peaks and troughs were in, in, in my ability to walk. But that, that simple stuff. The thing is, you can't expect people with <coughs> Parkinson's to be doing that all, to, all, the, all the time, every day. You, you need, um, I, I would say that what Kristalina is doing at the moment is, is, is the right baseline, the right, the right basic stuff for an, assess an accurate assessment. But what, we, what I feel we really need is continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. So something that we can wear fairly unobtrusively and measure us through the, because the thing is, I, I, I take, take, some, used to take some pride in, in saying I could fool, the, uh, your, fool your apparatus. Mm -hmm. And you and, do, Jim, very well. And I do. <laughs> the, the thing is, I. My normal day is spent waddling around or shuff, shuffling around the house, and and when I go for a walk outside, I can get a reasonable stride going after about five, five, ten minutes. But but when you're in a positive environment like your your lab and, and your researchers, it it lifts you, and you're able to walk better straight away. And so, I think nearly every time I've done your, your walking test with the accelerometers all over my body, I come up with parameters within normal range. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of concept because I, I don't know how to make you not fool my system, right? <laughs> <laughs> because he, you're so good within the two minutes that we ask you to, but then as soon as you're done, I can see how that declines. Yeah. And then portrays a clinical picture yeah. to say, you know, sort of shows more of what you're like during the day. Yeah. But can I ask you, what, is, what does art do to, means to well, you? Well, actually, that, that's, that, that, that's the, I was coming to the link in there. Oh, because, right, right. Because <laughs> the, the thing is, I, I, I commented that, that working with your team we're, we're you know, very positive researchers, it lifts my mood. 
And the, the, the thing that I've noticed about being, uh, having Parkinson's, I, was already, I always was a little bit of an emotional sort of person. You know, I, I, I blub a bit on, on TV programs. Uh, uh, the, um, and I would say I've got worse. Yeah. I, my, I, I feel emotions so much more real. Everything is, everything is um, heightened. Heightened. Yes. Yeah. The, the thing is, physically moving around is hard work. You have to put a lot of conscious effort into moving about. And that's what I do mm -hmm. when, I, when I fool your system. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm heightening myself consciously and, and I'm using emotions in the process. And the thing is, art can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, when, when, I, when I see something um, artistic, um, it, can, it can lift me. And similarly, it can, it, it, you know, the, the, the wrong sort of art can, can shock me, can uh, worry me. Um, I mean, we raised the point that, that uh, people with Parkinson's suffer from anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, the wrong sort of images can raise my anxiety. Uh, they can get me thinking about things that I otherwise wouldn't have thought about. So, so we're, very, we're very emotionally vulnerable. And I don't think that's something that's, that's really acknowledged. We're physically vulnerable, and I think everybody recognises that. But we're emotionally vulnerable as well. But, but art has a role, and you know, a walk in the park, uh, sun shining, uh, images like that will 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 lift us and, and, and help us to move better and do things better. Our, our symptoms are physically better when when we're when we're in a better mood. I, I I've often said. Parkinson's is 100% in the brain, 50% in the mind. And it's very true, very yeah. true, absolutely. And I wonder, yes. Jane, what do you think about um, what you've just heard, people who, who suffer from this condition, how does it make you feel in terms of thinking things, you know, taking things forward, the, think, the event we're doing here today and hopefully continuing? Yeah, well, well uh, firstly, when I was invited to this project, uh, it was very interesting because I was researching about the, about the, this neuroscience area, mm -hmm. but also I thought that neuroscience is still a bit far from the public as well as the Parkinson. Like, mm -hmm. well, we know the surface kind of. We know this well, what it is Parkinson as well. Like we know the Parkinson, we think that we know, but there are some more deeper inside as. Uh, you all said that it's also about the emotional. It's not just uh, showing the tremor and then that's it. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought uh, at the beginning, I thought that maybe art can bring some kind of topic to the public more and then make them more interested in the deeper knowledge mm -hmm. instead of just, uh, oh yeah, seeing the beautiful picture and then, oh yeah, it's emotionally good and then that's it. I, I don't think that art is just that. I think that art can do something, yeah, like bridging this art and science and then also public and then the experts. And I'm really glad that uh, I could bring sort of, like uh, Sally told me previously that uh, the, the sculpture I had really um, fills that what the Parkinson is in, in that, that figure. And I was so, so glad, I was so grateful that I could hear like that because I, I also, I, I am just an artist, so I kind of saw people from the outside. So I wanted to interpret the right way, but uh, I wasn't very sure until this moment. And then when you told me that, I was <laughs> so glad that uh, yeah, I could hear that. And then I wanted to yeah, bring the emotional point as well, not just a shakiness or not just a one kind of a feature of the Parkinson's. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a really lovely, positive note to end on. I'm so sorry. I, I'm really conscious that we're out of time. I know that you might have some more questions. 
hopefully, I mean, uh, these guys are going to stick around in the afternoon as well. The, um, yeah, John's actually going to be doing some demonstrating, hopefully, up in the Randolph Sculpture Gallery. So please stay around and have some more informal conversations as well.